So without further ado, the reason we're all here, Trudy Hanmer. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. We also have some former trustees in the room. I'd like to just mention that they're here, and that's great for me, and um, because I know them, uh, along with all of the former students of mine. Uh, now, even though I know some of you received your books at the end of last week because I signed them in Troy and we mailed them out, I am going to hazard a guess that no one's read it yet. Uh, <laughs> And you'll be happy to know I am not going to read it to you cover to cover tonight. <laughs> Friday in Troy, I tied the history of Emma Willard to the history of the city. But next to Troy, New York City is arguably the most important city in the early history of the school. So for a few minutes tonight, I thought I'd outline some of the connections between the school and the Big Apple. The people who are with me from school are very happy. They don't have to hear the same speech over again. <laughs> um, some of these connections are in the book, but some of them were edited out. It was getting long. Um, so there will be a little bit of extra information. The first connection between the school and New York City was the presence of girls from the city when the school was in Waterford, New York. As most of you know, uh, certainly all the alumni know, it started in Middlebury, Vermont in 1814, moved to Waterford in 1819, and finally made it to Troy in 1821. But the first catalog of students that we have was published in 1820 when the school was still in Waterford. And there were five students from New York City. None of them wrote in later to the school to say what they were doing or anything like that. So it's very hard to know much about them. The other thing some of you may not know is that the Census of the United States until 1850 did not list women and girls by name. So uh, I can look up their last names in the 1820 census and see that Yes, there were, in fact, white females living in that household between the ages of 10 and 15, but that doesn't tell you very much about them. Their surnames were Fanning, Bailey, Ketchum, and Cotheel. Trying to trace them without knowing their father's name is difficult, but it is very likely that one of them was a sister of one of the first members of the St. Nicholas Society of New York, one of the oldest exclusive clubs here in the city whose founders also included Washington Irving, who sent three nieces to the school. And Ketchum was probably the sister of William Ketchum, who left New York for Buffalo and became one of that city's early mayors. Bailey and Fanning are lost to the ages. Well, after Waterford and over the course of the school's first decade in Troy, a number of New York City girls made the trek up there. Between 1822 and 1829, a total of 67 young women from Manhattan enrolled at the Troy Female Seminary. That's a big number. It's bigger than today. The school grew up with the growth of New York City as a financial and merchant center. In 1817, just three years after Emma started in Middlebury, the New York Stock Exchange opened. And two years later, of course, the first real depression and panic in US history occurred. New York recovered pretty quickly from the 1819 panic, but in 1820, Madam Willard had to slash tuition in half as a result of the financial depression just to keep the school going. The school grew, nevertheless, probably because of the half tuition. Um, the reason for the New York recovery was also one of the reasons for the school's prosperity, the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was being built, and there was a promise of expanding Western markets. At 10 o'clock in the morning on October 26, 1825, a cannon fired in Buffalo to announce the opening of the canal and the spilling of water from Lake Erie into the new canal. For the rest of the day, imagine this, guns strategically located along the canal fired their cannons in order. The salute reached New York City and then turned right around and returned up the river and west to Buffalo. 
As part of the celebration, Emma Hart Willard and some of her students went to Albany to meet the packet boat coming from Buffalo. Dignitaries from New York were also there to commemorate the moment, including Richard Riker, the recorder of the City of New York, whose two daughters, Anna and Elizabeth, were studying at the Troy Female Seminary. DeWitt Clinton, the New York governor who would champion girls' education and push a bill to support the seminary through the legislature, made the first canal journey from Buffalo to Albany and then sailed on to New York. It took him eight days, a new record. Steamboats were already making the trip on the Hudson from Troy and Albany to New York, at least during those months when there was no ice on the river. The trip in the 1820s, however, took 36 hours. Progress was fast. By 1840, Philip Hone, an early mayor of New York, would record in his diary, the rapidity of traveling astonishes us who remember how it worked before the use of steam, when a week was consumed in a voyage to Albany from New York. Now we dine at Saratoga and arrive in New York before the people are stirring. Now, of course, as soon as people from upstate could get to New York, they went. <laughs> Before 16-year-old John Willard, Emma's only son, headed for West Point in 1826, his mother took him to Manhattan for one last fling. As she wrote to a friend, I rented a hack and showed him around the city. Uh, John flunked out of West Point. <laughs> He missed the creature comforts of home in Manhattan. <laughs> Over the course of time, the lure of New York and the development of New York as the financial capital of the country and ultimately the world meant that small northeastern cities like Troy eventually lost capital and people. Everything was bigger and better in Manhattan. For example, at the time of the Civil War, women's organizations all over the North raised money uh, for, through events called sanitary fairs, which were to help wounded Civil War soldiers on the North. Of course, the New York City Sanitary Fair raised the most, two million. The organization was led by Sarah Hoyt Spellman, a Troy female seminary graduate. Now, in terms of our history, probably the most famous Trojans turned New Yorkers were Russell and Margaret Olivia Slocum Sage. But they were definitely not alone. The Willards themselves oriented more and more toward New York City as they got older. Uh, Emma had one son. Uh, her son John and his wife Sarah had ten children. But of those ten children, only six uh, lived to maturity, and those six were all girls. Three of them never married, but the three who did, Emma, whose name was Emma Willard Willard, uh, <laughs> this was a family who knew where their bread was, be but was buttered. Um, Emma married Henry Joel Scudder, a successful Manhattan attorney. Catherine, 60, class of 65, married Howard Lapsley, a merchant in Manhattan. And Mary was the wife of Dr. Theodore Gaillard Thomas, who chaired the Department of Gynecology at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons for about 30 years. Dr. Thomas encouraged his clients to use the restorative powers of the ocean in their recovery from childbirth. And he practiced what he preached. The Thomases were among the first New Yorkers to build a summer home in the Hamptons. Sarah and John Willard, uh, Willard visited their three married daughters often, and Sarah was present at most of her grandchildren's births. The three girls who married produced 14 children. In the 1860s and 70s, the Willards even paid pew rent just up the street, down the street, at Grace Church. I'm confused. Um, in the neighborhood. In 1872, when the Willards retired from the school, it ceased being a boarding school. And for the most part, became a local day school, its national reputation fading. As a newspaper article described the school at that time, bathed in sunshine half the day and clothed in shade the other half, the Troy Female Seminary Building, like some honored old citizen, is passing the remainder of its days in peaceful retirement, its energy like the last pulse beats of a dying man. Okay. It was not a good time. 
But at this point, a group of women who lived in Manhattan stepped forward to save their alma mater. Led by Mrs. Sage, they formed the Emma Willard Association in 1891, the beginnings of a formal alumni association. They held their first annual banquet on October 15, 1891 at the Plaza, and these banquets, which they held for the next 20 some years, were covered by the New York Times and other newspapers with detailed descriptions of the menu. The first menu, you'll be happy to know, had eight courses, from oysters to pudding Troy Female Seminary, that was its name, <laughs> and between the sixth and seventh courses, uh, the women cleaned their palates with sorbet Emma Willard. <laughs> uh, the decorations were lavish, pink flowers already, uh, already in attendance, and of course the women's dresses were described in full. However, they were not poo-pooed as simply society butterflies. The graduates who gathered at the plaza each year were a power in the land, cultured, ambitious, refined, and womanly, an honor to themselves and to the school of learning in which they were equipped and trained. They supported suffrage. They heard controversial speeches on pacifism and imperialism during the Spanish-American War. They learned about women's increasing role in the workplace. They supported settlement houses, uh, the rights of immigrants, and the role of public education. The annual events in Manhattan attracted leading alumni from Troy and other cities. Brooklyn was always well represented by Clara Stranahan, whose husband James Stranahan, known as Mr. Brooklyn, was a major force in that city and a trustee of the Brooklyn Bridge Company. Consider this, when the Brooklyn Bridge opened in 1883, Chester Arthur was president, he was on the dais, and so was Brooklyn Mayor Seth Lowe, and so was James Stranahan. Arthur's sister Mary had ser was serving as his hostess in the White House. She graduated from the Troy Female Seminary in 56. Lowe's stepmother, Annie, had raised him. She graduated in 38. And then, of course, there was Clara St Stranahan. The banquets in New York attracted national attention as well. From Chicago came Nettie Fowler McCormick, who by the 1890s was running the multi-million dollar corporation that had grown from her late husband's Reaper Company. In 1893, for the Chicago Exposition, the Emma Willard Association sponsored an Emma Willard exhibit that brought national attention for the founder and her school. By then, the Emma Willard Association had also brought new life to the campus in Troy. Gurley Hall had opened in 1892, and the Sages announced that they were giving the money for a dormitory that would open in 1895 and revitalize the school's boarding department. Manhattan's alumni had led the way to a new phase in the school's history. And tonight, with this fabulous turnout, we see that Manhattan's alumni remain a vital force for their school. Thank you. And I will take questions if anybody's read the book. <laughs> yes. What inspired you to, uh, to write on this huge project? Um, I, you know, I, I actually started at almost the first... Can you, can you hear the question? Okay, yes, repeat the question. What inspired me to take on the project? I actually began years and years and years ago when I first came on the campus because I felt as though the school's history was so important in the history of women's studies, American social history, and I was stunned that no one had ever uh, written a history of the school. There are a couple of biographies of Emma Willard, but they're outdated and uh, uncritical, to say the least. <laughs> so I thought it would be a great project, but you know, a few things intervened <laughs> along the way. <laughs> a lot of the people in this room intervened. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Priscilla. Um, what was the most dramatic, unexpected discovery that you made? Uh, most dramatic, unexpected discovery that I made um, was that Emma Willard and Lafayette did not have an affair. No, that's <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, but that wasn't it. Uh, uh, probably 
the role that the 19th century graduates played in education all through the country and the connections um, that they forged uh, throughout the nation and, and actually abroad as well. Yes. Are there any descendants of Evan Willard still alive? Yes, there are. Um, and I've spoken to a couple of them. They're very distant, you know, and, and all of her descendants are through the female branches, so there are no Willards left. And of course, Willard was her married name. Uh, anyway. Um, the, yes, they did, up through the early 20th century, but not, not since about 1916. Um, there are, uh, you know, and then there are people, I, I will digress. I had a phone call Friday. Now, Friday was the day of our big thing, and I got this phone call, and it was a voicemail message from a man who said, my wife tells me you've written a book about Emma Willard, and she's my ancestor, and I really want to talk to you. And I said, uh, Friday, I can't do this. So I called him yesterday afternoon and introduced myself. And he's, I said, I'm fascinated uh, because your name is not familiar to me. How are you related? Oh, well, and I'm making up names now. Um, my dad, Joe Casey, is her grandson. And I said, Oh, that's very interesting. Um, there are no Casey's on any of the uh, family trees that we have, but if you have a family tree and can send it to me, I'd love to see it. My dad told me he was. I said, oh, okay. And uh, did he tell you how he's related to Em Willard? He said, he's her grandson. And I said, well, thanks. Okay, <laughs> it's been good to talk to you. I mean, <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> yes. Well, we going into a little bit how we went about the research. It seems like it's monumental. It's well, it was a lot of research. I uh, I outlined the book first, and I determined early on that it would be a, in chronological order for the most part. Uh, for those of you who've read the first chapter, there might be a few of those. Um, it's it does start in 1870 with the death of the founder, and then goes back to the beginning after that. Um, and so I roughed out periods of the history and what I wanted to get into those. Um, I knew that I did not want it to be the kind of school history that so many schools have, which is just head after head after head and what the administration did, you know, that kind of thing, uh, sort of the great man. Uh, history. I wanted to get into it much more of the faculty voice and the student voice and that sort of thing. So I read everything I could possibly read. <laughs> yes, what Claire. Files the have? We have a lot on you, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> We, no, we, we have um, a really, really wonderful archive for a secondary school. Um, and we have a wonderful archivist. She's half time, but um, she is just devoted to it, Nancy Iannucci. And she was a huge help to me. But we have, you know, catalogs. We have every issue of clock that was ever written, every issue of triangle. Uh, Triangle's been around since 1901. We have all the minutes of the Emma Willard Association meetings in Manhattan, so, you know, I know what they ate every year. Uh, we have um, letters, extensive uh, letter collections from the 19th century. We get wonderful um, material artifacts all the time. Recently, we received a dress, a graduation dress from graduation in 1850. And it's white. <laughs> it was started, they were white even back then. Um, and it's, it, it's about a size, I, I know there's a size zero in the world today, and this would be about a size minus 12. <laughs> um, so, I don't, we don't have a freshman who would fit into it. <laughs> Francesca. Did you include anything about Paul Gilligan? 
I, di I did because it's my time on campus. And uh, so, yes, there is um, the, quite a bit about uh, Gilligan's work and the impact that it had on curriculum and the 1980s. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, from graduates, I know a little bit about the feeling of what it was like to Emma Willard in the late 40s and 50s. What was it like in the social upheaval of the 60s and 70s? Well, there are people here who live through it. Um, does that? Does, I would tell you that from the from the record, I would say that the social upheaval of the '60s, with the exception of the schools um, opening up the girls intellectually to things like the civil rights movement, in terms of social life and uniforms, the '60s passed the place by. That's. Anybody want to dispute that? Go ahead. <laughs> the, curric the curriculum changed in the 70s as well. But yeah, the curriculum changed in the 70s. But the 60s, when things were you know, happening on other campuses, there were still a lot of rules, a lot of rules about uniforms. Uh, girls were not allowed to go into downtown Troy, you know, that sort of thing. It changed in the 70s. It changed in the early 70s. Uh, because all of the boys' schools were going co-ed, and if they were going to have any students, they had to loosen up. <laughs> That's really honestly why it changed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Is the children's school part of the history? Is the children's school a part of the history? Yes, the children's school is a part of the history, as are other iterations of children's schools, which were on the campus um, throughout uh, the period of time. Emma Willard herself enrolled girls as young as nine um, and as old as 30. Yes, because widows with no means of support would come to the school to be trained as teachers. She would train them with the understanding that they would pay back um, when they were earning a living. So, so, and she used those older women um, at, sort of as proctors in the lingo of today and also as um, assistant teachers to give them sort of teacher training, that kind of thing. So that, it, it seemed to have worked out quite well. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> I traveled as well, uh, but there was there's a lot in the Emma Willard archive. But there's Amherst College, for example, is home to all of the Willard family papers. I traveled to uh, the Wellesley College archives to uh, look up things about Miss Lay, who was a Wellesley graduate and also a. Um, uh, worked there, and Miss Wellington worked there. The University of Wisconsin Historical Society has all of Nettie Fowler McCormick's notebooks from the Troy Female Seminary, which were just fascinating to see. Um, that woman never threw away a scrap of paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did do some some travel. And for the women of the 60s and the 50s out there, this may have been the biggest discovery. Miss Lay was married for a very, yes, see, look, almost fell out of her chair. <laughs> yes. What did you do when you had writer's block? What did I do when I had writer's block? I know this will come as a huge surprise to you, but I've never had writer's block. <laughs> I, my biggest problem is cutting down on what I write, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah. Yes? No, no, very briefly. <laughs> no. Yes, it was a secret romance. He was in the tower. No. Um, <laughs> No, she was married uh, for under six months, uh, uh, which it, I'd always heard this rumor. Uh, sometime in the 20s, she met him. He was a professor at Grinnell, and she was an instructor at Grinnell at the time, and they met there. She was from Marshalltown, Iowa. Uh, the reason, where did I find this? In her uh, questionnaire for her reunion at Wellesley under 
you know, husband, um, and she writes, divorced in letters about the, as big as this room. Um, <laughs> and then she also said that she had taken her name back by court order with 4,000 exclamation marks and underlinings. <laughs> and, um, and then, and this will also not surprise those of you who studied under Miss Wellington and Miss Lay, she did not give his name, but she did list his degrees. His. <laughs> His Harvard undergraduate and uh, uh, PhD from Chicago were important to her. <laughs> so, yeah. Anybody else? I, I'm not, oh, Jane. I have not read, but I will. Uh, was there ever a time when this fear of the unknown was something that you think that were going on either politically or economically? Because I am a I, I belong to the cult of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was there ever a time that it just looked so gloomy and horrible? The, from 1872 to 1891, in that period of time, it got very local. Um, the sort of grand vision was no longer there. Yeah, there was also a very grim time during the Depression. In the fall of 1938, the school had one freshman boarder. So um, that's that's about as low as we want to go, right? Oh, former former director of enrollment over there. <laughs> you thought you had tough times. She <laughs> was really good at morning reports. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there were, you know, the 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 title, as most of you know, comes from a line in the alma mater, and the picture. On the, uh, on the book, the book cover, um, was taken by my daughter, who's class of 2005. Uh, and she took it last spring on a stormy day. She just drove up to campus to see me. And these storm clouds were coming over the buildings. And she whipped out her cell phone, because we all have cameras now all the time, and took this picture. And I wasn't, I loved the picture right from the beginning, and I thought it fit the title so perfectly that I wanted to um, use it uh, for the book. So, uh, and I think the idea is there have been times, rough times, and through it all, either trustees, faculty, heads of school, uh, parents, students, groups of Emma Willard people have grabbed the spirit and, and gotten us through. So, yes? So when I think of Emma Willard, and I kind of celebrate this history, I think of this kind of very feminist history, right? And we talk about Carol Gilligan, the revolution of world education. I'm just kind of wondering, as you contextualize, the history of Emma Willard as a school within the longer history of kind of women's history, women's history, Well, there are, I think, about four questions there. But um, <laughs> the f first of all, I would say I have tried in the book to give the context at each um, in each era for where women were and what the role of the school was, and either advancing or, in some cases, retarding that progress, fighting that progress. Um, the second part of your question had to do with Gilligan's, wait. Well, not just Gilligan's work, but I think of like those, like, like I arrived just after Gilligan. Yeah. So I think of like, you know, starting at the school, I think of arriving there with kind of Carol Gilligan reviving and challenging yeah. kind of all of these. Kind of, right. It's not a very feminist tradition, so I'm just kind of wondering. You know, well, it's. In between, the legacy in between. The, it, well, today, I mean, the, you know, we've we've gone through the phases where the girls don't want to be called feminists, they don't, feminazis, you know, all of that sort of thing. Um, we now are at a point where I think we're sort of, and I'm sure that there's some great cultural historian out there who will challenge me on this, post-feminism to a certain extent, but they don't uh, want to be taken as anything but themselves and seriously. But they wouldn't necessarily define that as feminism. They wouldn't think they needed to. That's you know where they are. So um, and so at each you know at each phase. I mean, in the late 40s, early 50s, and I don't know if the people hear from that. One of the problems for Miss Wellington and Miss Lay was that the young women who were going out of Emma Willard to college were dropping out of college to get married. 
Um, and that was a trend around the country. It wasn't just Emma Willard graduates by any stretch of the imagination. So there was that sort of um, issue. And of course, in the early, uh, throughout the 19th century, the early 20th century, most of the faculty were women and they had chosen teaching over marriage, that that was a career, you know, it was career or marriage, you couldn't do both. Um, so that gets played out in the girls' reactions to them, not wanting to be Vera Smith. <laughs> See, I knew I could bring a laugh with that one. <laughs> um, she was a science teacher, and I've been, yes, I've, <laughs> Yeah, you, you stole my punchline, but I have heard, I have heard from conservatively 75 alumni that Vera Smith's first words every September on the first day of biology was, were, I gave up sex for science. <laughs> this did not inspire scientists, I am here to tell you. <laughs> Yes, one, one woman has described to me seeing, and I'm quoting again, seeing Miss Smith hopping in her tweeds and sturdy browns across the fields looking for specimens. I was terrified. <laughs> okay, I will be, oh, sorry. Go oh. ahead, Jam. <laughs> so I had enough time to read the picture caption. <laughs> And I noticed that um, Dietl had like a really big role in the civil rights movement, and I want to know like what kind of controversies that sparked around the campus. With that being said, well, we have a couple of people here who were part of that. Do you want to address it, or do you want me to say what I think? I'd rather you say what you think. Okay. <laughs> All right. The question had to do with Bill Dietl's, um uh, initiation of discussions on campus about the civil rights movement. Um, he he. Uh, uh, got the board to, to approve joining um, ABC, increasing the number of African American students on campus, increasing uh, financial aid. He let um, some girls in the uh, 1968, I think it was, go work uh, for a month on Carl Stokes' campaign to become the first uh, black American to be mayor of a major United States city, Cleveland. Um, and the two women in the back seat, uh, back seat, back row, um, happened, happened at their, <laughs> back seats, back seats. We didn't ask you to sit there, okay? <laughs> so, they, their father was the first African American trustee on the board of trustees. So, and a good friend, I, I, from the correspondence, I would say a good friend of Bill Deedles. Yeah. Yes, okay. And again, I have to. The reason why the students went to Cleveland to work on the campaign, I had been a started with the civil rights group. We were Negroes in the 60s. Okay, <laughs> we're all Negroes, and I started the civil rights group on campus. And then my senior year, we um, put together a uh, civil rights conference and tried to get every black human being in every private school in New England to come. And Carl Stokes was the keynote speaker. And this is after he ran for mayor the first time and lost in Cleveland. When he ran the second time, I had left Emma. My sister came in 70, I left in 67, but when he ran the second time, because he had come to the school to speak, they sent four kids to stay in our house and to work the night of the campaign. And is it, didn't the civil rights um, group that you formed supersede the chapel group? Wasn't it a, didn't it take over the chapel group? No. It didn't? It didn't have yeah, okay. All right. Okay. No. All right. You know, I just started the civil rights group. Yeah. Stephen Dana was the um, advisor, and we tried to get speakers. It was also during the folk, folk singer. Yeah. You know, there was a lot related to music, and we tried to get speakers and did. Yeah. But we did get cross folks to come. Yeah. He had lost the first election. 
The other, the other uh, person who should be given some credit in this uh, vein is Miss Wellington. Um, because in the late 18, or 18, 1940s, um, Miss Wellington pushed the board to admit black students, and they did. And yes, Ann Thurman. And, and, and uh, yeah. He's in there. He's in there. Yes, Howard Thurman. Her father, Howard Thurman, had spoken at the school many, many times as a chapel speaker. Back then, there was required chapel on campus, and. Um, Howard Thurman said to Ann Wellington, I mean, we can't give Miss Wellington all the credit. Howard Thurman said to Ann Wellington, I'm not coming back until I can see a black face in that audience. And that's what. The reason why we ended up at Emma Wellington was he was taking Ann, we were little girls and we were much younger than Ann and Alice, and he was Papa Daddy to us. Yeah. Visionary to many black people. In Including country. Martin Luther King Jr., who studied with him. He was very close to Gandhi. Yeah. And he coined, he was the first person to coin the phrase multicultural. Yeah. He believed in all people's faith. He didn't like to fly. He spent a lot of time on a boat, he did spend a lot of time with Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King. And he was at Howard University at a time when that was one of the smallest schools <laughs> was my that uncle. educated black people, which means they're baby boomers, many of whom the black leaders in this country all revere this man. And um, he's written quite a bit that yeah. he was a man ahead of his time. Any more questions we can break? And people can ask me individual questions. I think there are a few more books I need to sign. Another question. The last question. Yes. Well, two prongs. What, what, and what, when did, I, I, I'd like to say that initially it was all about how to manipulate your husband to make good decisions, sort of like appeasing the okay. Yeah. 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 Y
And I've gotten back involved with the school about two years ago as part of the uh, board, but more on the development side. So one of the co-leaders for the EMMA Fund, annual, annual fund, but the EMMA Fund, as a way to get back in touch with the school, both as a whole community, which includes the current students, the faculty, the administration, and most certainly the alums. So it's been a great opportunity to network. And so one way that I want to tout, if you haven't done so already, there's a new Emma app. Right now it's just for alumni, not parents or friends, maybe yet. But I certainly encourage you to download the app. For me, it's been great. When I travel, and I travel a fair amount, I can look at who are the, the alums in the area. So you can stay connected to alums in your, type in your zip code, find out who's near you. You can stay current on news that's happening at the school, events like this. So find opportunities to come out and network. There's also information about the bicentennial. So you can stay Stay as current as possible, but it's it's great. And I will have this. Heather may have this, so you can find out more about how to download it. There is also some information up on the table up front that tells you how to download the app. Okay. I'm not going to go into the technical aspects of that, but it's cool. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to plug a little bit is the, the with, with the bicentennial. There's also the bicentennial challenge which is about participation. It's part of the EMMA Fund, and it's about increasing alums, parents, and friends, everybody's participation in the EMMA Fund. So I encourage you, I thank you for those who have already given. For those who have not, there's an opportunity to give tonight. So you can talk to Heather or Lisa and do so, but uh, please take some more time and chat amongst yourself and keep networking. This is just a fantastic community. So thank you. Thank you.